Welcome to the Hockey Writers Prospect Corner, a show with our top prospects writing crew, bringing you the latest news, analysis, scouting reports, mocks, rankings, and much more. From the world juniors to the NHL draft floor, from the farm to the NHL, our team covers everything that happens in the world of prospects. So sit back, grab a notebook, and get ready for Prospect Corner. Prospect Corner. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Prospect Corner here at the Hockey Writers. I'm your host, Matthew Zator, and as always, I'm joined in by prospect analysts here at the Hockey Writers, Peter Barracchini and Dayton Reimer. Peter, welcome back to the show. It's been a couple couple weeks. It's just been me and Dayton just going through the farm rankings, but how's it going? It's going great. Yeah, a busy couple of weeks on my end. Now that everything has subsided and the chaos is done, glad to be back talking prospects here, guys. Sure. And Dayton, how's it going? Good. Made a little uh, quick trip out to some family on the weekend and caught a Calgary Hitmen game. So got to do a little bit of scouting of Carter Yakumchuk. Man, is he frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> the good and the bad. Oh, my goodness. And that was a good and bad game for him. One of mm-hmm. the most polarizing I've seen. Um, yeah, it's wild. Great prospect, but so many problems. Mm hmm. Yeah, well, we'll we'll be talking about uh, about these guys more as the draft uh, gets closer, and as our prospect profiles come out, uh, we'll be doing a lot more about for these guys. So, uh, on that note, we're going to be talking about Peter's latest draft rankings that were released at thehockeywriters.com, but top ninety six now. Uh, and this is your March rankings. I believe that's your fourth. It is what? my, yeah. uh, if you count the early one heading into the season, September, January. So yeah, fourth. Yeah. So fourth set coming out. I uh, So getting close, getting down to the wire. I believe you probably have another two before the final. Yes. Or another one, something like that. Uh, so we'll be going through it again. Uh, but we're going to be going through your latest ones now. And let's get right into it and start with your top five. I don't know. Is there any changes? We'll see. But uh, what's your top five right now? Yeah, compared to uh, my January one, uh, there is some movement. And uh, I thought I was a little bit confident with how things played out last time. But, you know, rankings always change. You wouldn't be doing your job if, you know, you kept the same thing over and over again. So my first five is no surprise. You know, Macklin Celebrini, number one running away with it. There's no, no chance of anybody catching him, but this is where things get a little interesting. Um, I did previously have, um, you know, Sam Dickinson number two, but it is now Ivan Demidov at two. Sam Dickinson dropped to three, Caden Lindstrom at four and Berkeley, Berkeley Catton at five. Yeah. The, your Sam Dickinson dropped down. And uh, I think that's your, I believe Dickinson was two. Oh, I think Cole, Cole Eisner. He was, was yeah. Yeah. Dickinson I, and Lindstrom were my top, right. uh, rounded out my top three. Yeah, so a little bit changes there. Uh, Dayton, looking at that top five, uh, what do you think about him? Uh, I love Catton in the top five. I think he is a top five talent. Um, just the way that he approaches the game, the way he is able to use his speed and agility to avoid getting hit. Uh, because he is a little on the uh, the smaller side, but like he's not that small. And yeah, I, I think he's up there with Demidov as the second best forward. Um, I like seeing Caden Lindstrom in there, but having him drop isn't unexpected because he's been mm-hmm. sidelined with that injury for months mm-hmm. now, and which is, yeah, that's that's concerning. But when he has played, he's been really good. So I think still a, a top five guy. Some other rankings i was looking at have him dropping out of that that's a little i think presumptuous Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. yeah really good top five um i I enjoy that you have sam dickinson as your top guy still for defense (laughs) yeah nothing's going to change about that (laughs) yeah i don't agree with it Uh, i think he's close to the top for me but um i can see why he would be the top he's he's Mm -hmm. incredible yeah, those those five like I love Berkeley Catton in there. I've said that a few times just because of his game is just so much so exciting, and uh, the fact that he's you know the top you know top center. Uh, this is going to be a guy that a lot of teams are going to want, even though he is a bit undersized. But 
we have seen that's not as big of a deal anymore. Uh, just seeing what, you know, Zach Benson's doing uh, in Buffalo right now, it, it doesn't really matter as much. Um, yes. I mean, the playoffs, maybe these, these smaller guys get pushed around a bit, but they still can hold their own for sure. So Canton being there, definitely. I, I like that. All right, Peter, uh, going to your rest of your top 10, uh, round it out for us. Yeah, so at six is uh, Anton Saleev, uh from Torpedo uh, Novgorod in the KHL. Zeev Bouyam at seven from the University of Denver. Um, Zane Parekh uh, at eight from the Saginaw Spirit. As you can see a trend, you know, now the defensemen are starting to be very, you know, the picks after that are very defense heavy. Uh, Kansa Hellenius at number nine and at 10 is uh, Cole Eiserman. Well, Eisman's still in the top 10. I don't, mm-hmm. I believe he was, he was in your top 10 in the last one. He dropped, uh, was just inside at nine, but just bumped right. down one spot this time around. So he's still in the top 10, uh, mm-hmm. falling a little bit, not too much. But uh, Dayton, what do you think about the rest of the top 10 for Peter there? I like that I'm doing the color commentary. That's great. Um, <laughs> I love the constant Hellenius in the top 10. I don't think that is a given from other reports that I've read, but for me, he totally is that he's a really well-rounded forward. Um, like he just doesn't do things wrong. He not flashy. He's not exciting like Katten or Demidov, but really, really skilled. And I think he could be in the NHL a lot sooner than the other guys. Uh, I also like Boyum over Parekh. A lot of people are really mm-hmm. high on Parekh right now. Um, I mean, how could you not be? He's got so many points, and a lot of those are goals. Um, but I think Boyum's more well-rounded. I was watching yeah. Parekh, and I, I think there's a lot of bigger issues in his game than Boyum has. Boyum has a lot more well-rounded and maybe not as high of an upside, but definitely not quite as low of a a downside mm-hmm. if that makes sense no it does and uh, the fact that you know Parak, you know as good as the points have been you know you can't deny the offense but he the over aggressive tendencies that can get him out where it could lead to a bad pinch or a bad situation not so much but yeah no i do agree about Williams' overall game and if, if there's going to be an instance maybe he could overtake salai as well, not to say that you know Saleev is a bad prospect or anything. He came out uh, out of the, out of the bloom uh, at the beginning of the season, but now with Bouillon being a little bit more consistently offensively, hit uh, Saleev's game kind of take it took a dip as a result of that. But you know, can't deny the fact that he has the qualities that teams look for, or all three of them mm-hmm. actually uh, teams look for all three like the offense, the defense, the two way play. They're going to be very valuable in not necessarily those spots, but possibly within the first 15. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got four defensemen in your top 10. Uh, that's uh, almost half of them, half the top 10 <laughs> are defense. Uh, and that's probably going to how it's going to play out at the draft uh, when it does happen, because all these guys are most likely going to be gone by the 10th pick. Uh, a lot of teams are going to be going for these guys. These guys are going to be, top four for sure, some top pairing uh, defense that we've talked about many times on on the show about <laughs> that this draft is defense heavy and not just quantity, but quality. Uh, lots of great defensemen that are going to come out of this draft, we're thinking at least. Uh, we'll have to wait <laughs> for it to actually happen. But All right, let's move to risers because uh, we already had a couple uh, Peter, who are your risers from your last uh, set of rankings there? Uh, there are quite a few. Um, I am going to talk about uh, one in particular, uh, Michael Hage from the Chicago Steel. Um, obviously, you know, there's a lot of like talk about, you know, Trevor Connolly as the top USHL player, but, you know, it took a while for Hage to take it, to get a stride. He came off a uh, major soldiery in the off season. He was back on track and he looked really good. Um, you know, when I, in my January rankings where he was just over a point per game, which is what you want to see. But then he's really popped off as, um, you know, in the last nine or so games, he's had like 17 points. And this is, a uh, you know, um, 
after a really rough stretch, maybe not being as consistent, but towards this end of the second half, he's really popped off in a big way for the Chicago Sion. He's carried this team on his back. Um, uh, if I believe uh, I'm just going to f- try and find the updated stats because I'm, I'm reading my pro f- or my rankings. It's probably not going to be the same as it was two weeks ago. Um, 65 points in 48 games right now uh, for Haig. Uh, actually, uh, he's got... He's actually tied with Connolly. Uh, Connolly has a better point per game average, but even in the last like stretch, Haig has really popped off. So I'm really high on him as a re- as a result of that, um, where the points are coming, the consistency, and even the high end skill is showing off with his speed, his playmaking. Um, it, 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 he's not getting enough attention, and he should right now. Um, one of my favorites in the draft, Jet Lachenko, who was in a second round spot in January. I uh, believe he was 51. He moved into my first round. Again, maybe not the best skill or maybe best puck sense, but the awareness of where he needs to be, the tenacity and the intensity that he could play with, the work ethic that he has and the speed and edge work to get out of tough situations. He's already got some pro qualities right now. Not all, but I do think that there are some things to like in his game. And I just love the way that he competes hard. Um, reminds me of that or follows in the same footsteps as kind of like Matt Plotra did when he was with the, uh, the Storm as well. So uh, what, one of the other names that I'm very high on and another one, Dean Latorno, um, just ripping up the you know high school scene. Um as well as the prep hockey conference as well, the powerful shot that he has, but he's got the size, he's got the power and the strength and everything that he does. um, He plays with that, with that strength to his advantage. He uses the size, he uses those edges and he moves very well for his size. So those are some names that really caught my eye and moved up within my rankings compared to January up until now. Yeah, some good, great names. And the thing is, there's going to be even more event like the under 18s always produces more risers and uh, yeah. or solidifies guys where you put them. Uh, so that that's going to be something to look forward to that happens at the end of April. So we'll be covering that as well. Uh, so yeah, some great, great names there. Uh, Dayton, go over to you. Uh, looking at these rankings, uh, do you see any big risers uh, for you there? Yeah, a couple jump out to me. So uh, first, I actually mentioned at the top of the show, uh, Carter Yakumchuk. Mm-hmm. In your January ranking, he is 25th. He jumps up to 15th, I believe. And I think that's deserved. Like I mentioned earlier, he is a very frustrating prospect to very. place. Because <laughs> if you watched the top prospects game, you saw him take the puck from the blue line right to the front of the net. And he went through, I think, at least three guys to get that shot. That's incredible. Like, to have the strength and skill to get through that, uh, like all of those obstacles and still get a shot off is like not everyone can do that. That's something that needs to be recognized. He is a high offense guy who puts goals in and he's going to rank in the top 10 of draft eligible goals scored by a defenseman. He's got 27 right now. It's not impossible that he hits 30 unlikely but not impossible what i think still keeps him out of a top 10 spot is his decision making which is almost non-existent if that's not too mean to say (laughs) there are times where he makes incredible decisions and he's in the exact right spot he he cuts off a pass he you know pickpockets a guy and creates an opportunity passing it up to front Great. I saw those examples in the game that I watched. The very next shift, he'd be on defense, cough up the puck in the uh, in the offensive zone, and they'd get a great shot. And so could have had a goal directly influenced by something that he just didn't do. Or he's in the completely wrong position, and the puck scoots out to the other side, and he's nowhere to get it. And there was just moments of incredible awe and moments of I have to put my hands or my head in my hands because I don't (laughs) know what to do with him I think right now 15 is a great place for him 25 maybe feel a little low for somebody who could be a top pairing defenseman I mean you pair him with someone for example like a Chris Tanev Mm -hmm. I don't I don't think you have a problem but continuing the Calgary Flames metaphor if you put him with a Noah Hannafin you have major problems Mm -hmm. 
Um, last guy I'll mention here really, really quickly is Artem Levshunov. Uh, he did jump up a little bit on your ranking here. Um, I still think he's too low. He is a, I think, a top pairing defenseman, right-handed shot. He does have some of those issues you mentioned. But I feel like those can be easily coached out. Like, that's just him being young and inexperienced. Most of his game still looks really good and really calm, and he can make a lot of really good plays on both ends of the ice. So I see that you have him just outside of your top 10, but at least that's not 17 yeah. <laughs> or 18. <laughs> yeah, I, I the one I'll mention, and I see Cole Hudson uh, jumped a bit. <laughs> he jumped 10 spots, I believe. <laughs> I so he's getting a bit more love, but I mean, I see why he's he's kind of dropped out of the first round. Uh, he's closer to the top of the second now, but I, you know, he he's just not producing as much as you know as much as we've hoped that he would. Maybe uh, Lane Hudson, I believe, was a lot more productive. I and they're similar defensemen. I still think he's going to be a great great guy in the future. It's just where he will get picked is going to be interesting. I think he's probably still going to be a guy that will be picked at the end of the second round, round where you kind of have him. I I I really don't think he'll be a first round pick unfortunately. So, there's just so many great defensemen in the first round. I, it's going to be hard for some of these fringe guys to make their way into it. So, uh, that one was was a good one. I just like that he's he's jumped a bit. All right, the other side is fallers uh peter what what any f- big fallers from your last rankings uh charlie elick is one um you know I, obviously there's some defenders that i i feel have a little bit more upside to give even offensively like someone like ej emery even though they're very similar size i feel like his transitional game may be a little bit more better and more refined so elick is one name that dropped out Messe as well uh, from the QMJHL. Again, there seems to be a lot more forwards with better upside and a little bit more consistency to his game. Uh, he dropped all the way down to 50, and he was just inside my first round before. So that's one name where, you know, and we, we were even talking about this before the we started recording too. The Q really made, doesn't really have a whole lot of you know, top tier mm-hmm. talent, or you may have like someone like Massey be so be a late first, but usually we're used to seeing QMJHL players, you know, crack, you know, top 20, top 15, even top 10 mm-hmm. uh, in recent years. Um, maybe a little bit more of a quiet draft this time around. Then again, you could always find like, you know, other top talent. Cause I know Ra- Raul Boyard, who was a standout at the top prospects game. He's in my top 40, but he's my top ranked QMJHL forward compared um, to other players, he's still lower in that. Um, so he, those are a few names that really dropped out um, <clears throat> as a result of that. Anthony Cristoforo as well, he was in my second round. He's completely fallen out of that. It's been a rough year for him. I do like the upside that he has with his puck movement, playmaking, and all that from the back end because he was really strong during that Helenka Gretzky cup. He was a really strong, impactful defenseman and got involved in a lot of key goals. It's been a struggle since then. And this year has been, has been dealed with a lot of ups and downs in regards to consistency, consistency in his overall play. So I really liked him. I still do. I think he could be a, a good flyer later on unless he improves his stock, but um, he's taking a drop as a result of that. Yeah, it's tough for some players uh, dealing with different things and inconsistency. I mean, that just happens. Uh, and one I'll mention is Aaron Kiviharyu. He's now into the second round. Uh, he's 27th, so just at the end of the first. Now he's into the second round, 41st in your latest rankings here. I mean, that's that's just, that's just again, talking about injury. And that, unfortunately, is just the viewings. You're not able to see a guy and other guys are playing and playing better they're going to they're going to inevitably raise up and go past them i uh, and as a result you're going to have a guy that a team's going to pick and end up getting a steal because of that so uh Kiri Haru is still going to be a i mean where was he at the beginning he was pushing top 10 we were talking about him maybe being one of the top defenders now he could be a second round pick 
So uh, that that's going to be something to watch. Uh, another one, Adam Juracek, again, injuries. I mean, he hasn't been, he hasn't played since the world juniors when he got hurt and that that's going to be, be tough. And he, he was pushing to be a top 10 guy. He is still in your first round. He's still a top 20 pick, but I, uh, he may end up falling down further just because more. of his injury. Right. Mm-hmm. And especially I'm writing his team. <laughs> especially if a playoff team kind of picks him up or swoops in, because there may be a little bit more of a bigger sample from his game. Yeah. Again, like you said, injuries as well, but you know, there's the possibility that they could just swoop in and say like, you know what? We like his upside mm-hmm. injury aside. Yeah. I'm writing his profile too. Don't have as much to go on just from his <laughs> stuff at the at the beginning of the season, but I mean, there's enough to go on what what mm-hmm. he does and his skill set because he's still a really top high end prospect. It's just not as much to watch for him uh, just because of the injury. Dane, what what about you? Do you see any massive fallers from in this list from his, from Peter's last one to this one? Not any massive ones. Um... Tanner Howe dips down a little bit. Uh, and I think that's kind of what everyone was afraid of is he just doesn't have that support with Connor Bedard anymore. And there was hope that he could kind of carry the Regina Pats without them. Uh, he was their leading scorer, but I think they are like, they're already eliminated from the playoffs. There's no chance they can make it. Um, so yeah, seeing that, Regina kind of suffered so much this year, even while they had a potential first round pick, I don't think is going to help his draft cause. Um, another one, just got to find him here again. <laughs> I was actually a guy I also watched on the weekend. And I'm going to screw up his name because I don't know how to say it, but he's on the Lethbridge Hurricanes. Uh, Miguel Mark. Do you guys... Miguel Marquez. Marquez. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure if it was anglicized or not. So <laughs> that's uh, fantastic. Miguel Marquez. He looked really good um, playing against the Hitman. He's, he struck me as kind of like a pit bull on the ice there where he, he just goes for it. Uh, real high motor and, you know, you can't really stop him, but... Puck skills, I'm not sure if are mm-hmm. there compared to a lot of other guys available this year. So seeing him fall out a little bit, uh, he will have a chance in the playoffs with the WHL, uh, the Lethbridge Hurricanes. They will be in it. I don't know for how long the uh, division or conference that they're in is nasty. Um, and he's going to have to face probably one of the Saskatoon Blades, Moose Jaw Warriors, or... Um, Oh, I think the Swift Current Broncos are up there too. It's a, mm. it's a nasty conference. No but uh, <laughs> yeah, um, just another guy that I wasn't as impressed with as I was hoping I would be. Mm-hmm. I mean, these guys are, that's the thing. I mean, there's always going to be these fallers because of the risers <laughs> too. I mean, that's just that's how rankings go. I Before we move on to our uh, part of the show, uh, Dayton, did you have any... Dis- big disagreements of any of the rankings that Peter had. I'm throwing an audible in there. <laughs> That's all good. Um, I think my biggest disagreement was with Liv Shunov. I really like him still. I think he, for me, is my top defenseman. Um, and then this group of second guys are all really, really close. Like Dickinson and Salev and um, Boyum and Parekh. All of those guys are like really, really good. I still think Lev Shunov's too low. Mm-hmm. Um, another one I'm was just doing a little bit of uh watching today. Uh you have Green Tree, Liam Green Tree over Michael Brancig Nygaard. I think I would have those guys flipped. I watched Green Tree and I don't know if he's as good of a skater. Mm-hmm. He's got a great shot, he's really strong, he's a good power forward. But Brancic Nygaard's no slouch either. Like he's mm-hmm. not small at six foot one. He has that strength. He has much better skating. Uh, he can get that speed. And he still can score. He's putting up the most points in Sweden's second tier league of anyone under the age of 19, which is impressive. He's got a pretty good lead on the next guy, too. So 
I think those are the two ones that jumped out at me so far. But I'm sure I will have more later <laughs> as I'm putting together my own ranking, which will come out soon on the Substack. There you go. Well, that's a good uh, good, good segue. Uh, yeah, uh, make sure checking out our Substack at the Hockey Writers. Uh, we have one dedicated to all the teams of the NHL. We also got our NHL Draft and Prospect Substack run by Dayton. Uh, they're for the premium tier. He's got his rankings coming out soon. Uh, also, a couple deep dives that have been released on the, on that Substack Premium uh, tier. So check that out. Some great uh, analysis and deep dive. Uh, there's going to be our regular prospect profiles, but that's a little bit more uh, information. So check that out there in the link below. All right. Well, before we uh, move on to uh, some recent news, uh, Peter, any other prospects you want to kind of shout out of your rankings here, ones that maybe entered them. I just one that you kind of want to everyone to kind of keep an eye on maybe for profile coming up here. <laughs> um, you know, I not necessarily for a profile. If I do pick one, um, great. Um, uh, hopefully that there are going to be, there's definitely going to be profiles on these, uh, players regardless. Um, first thing I want to highlight is Noel Franzen. Um, not really getting the love from central scouting, not even ranked by them, but according to this elite prospects page, um, the hockey news is Tony Ferrari has him ranked. McKean's has him ranked recruit scouting has him ranked. So three outlets have him ranked and you know, he is literally just under a point per game in the J 20 level, 44 points in 45 games, 18 years old. I mean, the offense that he has is just absolutely outstanding. Um, I want to get a few more looks in his game have him i did have him i believe just outside or inside my second round last time and he kind of dropped a bit not by much but he's the name that's very that's really really intrigued me because of the offensive potential and pro and prowess that he does have every single time i mean he can score he can set up he already has to, he already has 20 goals. This is a player that should be on a lot of radars and he's definitely on mine. So we'll see what happens coming up. Uh, if, you know, he is 18 years old. Um, hopefully he'll be at the U 18. So can get a good look there and, you know, maybe what I've read, what I've seen in the past matches of what it seems, what I see with more viewings this time mm -hmm. around. Um, the other one I want to mention is Sam O'Reilly from the London Knights. And again, I, you know, I'm not, to like the London Knights, it has a fantastic system of developing players. This is a player that came out of nowhere, uh, not necessarily came out of nowhere, but you know, there what he wasn't on a lot of radars. And right now, I believe he's leading, hopefully, he's still leading all ro OHL rookies in scoring. Um, I believe he has. Let me just double check now. So he's third in rookie scoring. So he's kind of taken a dip. He was leading that previously before. He is 54 points in 66 games. But again, he has that. He he plays like a London Knight. In your face, intense. May not be the best skater. May not have the best upside overall. But man, does he work hard. He has strong two-way, like the two-way awareness that he has on both sides of the puck. The way that he puts himself in position, where minus that lack of speed, is absolutely phenomenal. Um. You know, I'm glad to see that, you know, I'm reading how there's, you know, a little bit more attention on him and I have him just inside my top 50 at 47, probably could move higher. And if he could add that added speed element to his game, he could be very, very impactful um, overall. I probably mentioned him last time. I'm going to mention him again uh, because I am very, very high on what he could bring to a table in like a middle six mm -hmm. role. Um yeah, and also, you know, two other D-men, Colton Roberts. I still like this game overall, even after the top prospects game. Even Spencer Gill, I'm starting to become a big fan of. Both have, besides, you know, the two-way uh, mindset on both sides of the puck. Breakouts are strong, you know, great in transition. Um, both defend very, very well. So those are two names that are at the end of my second round that could probably get a lot more attraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll see if they raise up uh, your rankings in your next one. So uh, definitely keep an eye on them and for their profiles coming out at thehockeywriters.com as well. Um, don't know when those will be, but uh, keep an eye out. Dayton, what about you? Any uh, names on either Peter's rankings or just 
you kind of want to mention that maybe didn't make it onto the 96 here? Um, yeah, a uh, few guys I'm going to be keeping my eyes on just as the WHL playoffs get started here pretty soon. Um, and that's just sort of my bias. I pay attention most to that while, you know, trying to but brush up on all the other ones as well. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not ignoring them. I just know the <laughs> WHL. Yes. Um, so few players, I think, could be in a really good position to have a long playoff run, which would help boost their standings in the draft. Uh, Colton Roberts, as you mentioned, he's with the Vancouver Giants. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a chance to go quite a ways, maybe not a long ways, but at least past the first round. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they got past the Wenatchee Wild, which is what mm -hmm. they're set up to match up against right now. Uh, and he's he's a really solid defenseman that could sort of be a difference maker, especially, you know, shutting down some of those high scores that Wenatchee could provide. Mm -hmm. um, another one uh, would be Andrew Basha. I know he's still in the first round, but the Tigers have been one of the teams to kind of be afraid of in the Eastern Conference in the WHL. And Basha has taken over the gap that's been left by Lindstrom. Lindstrom still hasn't returned. I think we mentioned that already. He's, yeah, he wasn't supposed to be out this long. So that's that's worrying. It's a wrist injury, if, mm -hmm. uh, if you didn't know. But with Basha, they still seem to be doing okay. Uh, more than okay, really. And they have a really strong team. He's a great playmaker. Can move the puck really, really well. He's good, a good skater. And if the Tigers go far, they should. They have the talent to do so. He will be another one kind of in that spotlight, helping them get there. Also helps they have Gavin McKenna. Uh, it does, I, yes. I, I will not go too much because <laughs> I know you're going to mention him later. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there's there's a lot of guys that you could keep an eye on. And the thing is, is like I'll mention uh Alexander Zetterberg. I've I've kind of kept an eye on him. I mean, he's fluctuated around different rankings. He's 54th on your latest one, but I'm always intrigued by a lot of these Swedes that could potentially go in this range. And Zetterberg has a lot of skill. He is a smaller guy, but I has a lot of skill and could end up still being a second round pick i uh, mid second round probably but he could fall fall a bit too who knows i he is i still think he's a really skilled forward that could potentially be a, one of those steals in the later not maybe later rounds but beyond the first round so i'll i'm going to keep they'll keep an eye on him and hopefully everyone else does as well all right. Well, that's your latest rankings, Peter. We'll wait for your next ones. I, you know, the the final rankings are a little bit down the road. I mean, you're going to have a, a couple updates before that. But I, I'll ask you one more question here. I, do you foresee any big changes uh, coming up in the next one? I, I mean, either by there's a few different events before that. I don't know if you're going to be doing one after or what will we'll be under after the under 18s. So. What guy do you see being the biggest mover at uh, coming up? Ooh, that is a really good question. Um, you know, I do think, you know, a lot of the Swedes, it, it, again, a lot of them, again, we're so pronounced or we're so well known to see them high early up because of the talent that they can produce. Mm -hmm. they, they seem to be flying under the radar, but, you know, who's to say that, you know, players like Lucas Pedersen can't move up. I, I have him 32nd, and he's just torching up the J20 level. So if he's going to be at that U20, uh, U18 uh, World Championship, he's one that could take advantage. Leo Salen Wallenius, uh, a lot of these players, even in the USHL too, there are a lot of like good names that I have mm -hmm. like early on in the second round, like Matt Vagridden, um, you know, John Mustard. Uh, there are there's even Harrison Brennicky. I know he's de dealing with an injury right now, but he jumped way up in my rankings because of the consistency that he has. Um, you know, I felt comfortable having him that high. So there are always going to be names that, you know, 
can jump up and it's going to be interesting to see. I, I know I mentioned him before, Anthony Cristoforo. I hope he's one that can, you know, find some steadiness in his game and move on up because I really liked what he did at, you know, the Lincoln Gretzky cup. Um, if he is made available uh, for the U18s, mm-hmm. I think that could be an opportunity for him to try and improve his stock and move back up into, let's say a, you know, at worst third round at best second, then again, who knows? It, it could, mm-hmm. it, it could, uh, there could be a lot of changes. So uh, especially with players going at the U18, that's kind of like not necessarily the final one um, that decides everything, but if they have a strong tournament, that's definitely something to consider um, in regards to their placement later on. Yeah, it's a big event. We'll be obviously covering it on the show, talking about it as it gets closer. So yeah, that, keep an eye out. And that does change a lot for different profiles that we put out as well. Um, and to potentially boost their stock too. So yeah, I keep an eye out for, for all that. All right, let's do some prospect news that just came out not that long ago that, uh, I mean, the wild potentially they've said that the wild could, could do something, Good. but most likely he will serve at Petrovsky will be re-entering the draft this year. So, and he was a, a six arm pick of the Minnesota wild in 2022, uh, his draft year, he had 28 goals, 54 points. Since then, uh, has had really strong numbers in the OHL. This season, he's got 19 goals and 51 points in 55 games. Last season, 55 points in 62. Uh, so he's could potentially get some, some interest in this year's draft. I'll go to you, Peter. Uh, what what do you see this? I mean, if he does re-enter the draft, where would you put, place him? Uh, he, he is an over, I mean, obviously an overager coming in at 19 years old i where would you where would you think uh, what he would get drafted would he be higher than the sixth round i would have to think it'd be higher than the sixth sixth round um be it the third or fourth i think that the, that he has shown in the past that he is very capable of being a very strong two-way versatile type of player with his playmaking and goal scoring um, you know, the vision that he possesses, the awareness, the IQ that he has on the ice to be in the right spots at the right time. And you saw that, you know, literally just in December, January at the world U 18s, where he was mm-hmm. arguably one of their better players uh, for team Slovakia, um, top three player for the team at that tournament. You know, he was a top three, uh, three player at last year's or in 2021, 22 at the world juniors as well. So, and that was in his draft year. So you know, being a top three player consistently in two tournaments, that's actually a very good sign that this is a player that, you know, it's unfortunate for both him and the wild. I think it was more of like a, I think they can't take on any more contracts, mm. which is unfortunate. And I think the wild probably would have liked to have had him on had they had the space, but unfortunately that's not the case. And I do think that because of his consistency, the way that he dominated or again, push, carry Slovakia to where they were in that tournament, they wouldn't have gotten far without him because he scored some really timely goals. Mm-hmm. Um, coupled with his playmaking, he, he could be a very dangerous, you know, middle six type of player, maybe in a bottom six role, but, you know, still have that intensity and the mindset to be a factor on both sides of the puck. I definitely think, personally, I think he can be a decent mid-round pickup. I don't think he should drop any further than that or go even even go back into the sixth round because you know there there is some good depth later on but when you have the experience that he has internationally at his age group and he's still taking big steps going into this draft or being re-entered into the draft i think it's something that there's going to be teams that are going to take a flyer on with a mid-round pick Mm -hmm. also that's he could enter uh, the pro game a lot sooner uh, yes. for for certain teams that need prospects a little quicker so he he could his development's a little bit further along. I, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. Wild have a really strong prospect pool. We'll get to them in our rankings, talking about more, more about it, but I, he's just pushed out by, by the other, the other prospects they got in that system. Right. I, and he'll join another one most likely. And we'll see who that is. Dayton, what do you, what do you think about uh, Petrovsky potentially re-entering the draft? Yeah, definitely didn't see that one coming. I thought, the wild would have opted for other prospects that they hadn't signed uh, instead of opting not to go for Petrovsky. But 
I, someone else's, you know, treasure, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think he could go as high as the second round. Like that's a 20 year old prospect who, like you mentioned, can be in the NHL, maybe not next year, but will definitely be in the AHL next year. Mm-hmm. Um, could be there in two, three years. That's really good for like a playoff team or even a rebuilding team who doesn't want to rebuild. Mm-hmm. The Ottawa Senators are always looking at overage prospects. Uh, it's it's become almost predictable. <laughs> They're going to take <laughs> one in like the third or fourth round. That's just what they do. Uh, if Petrovsky's there, he's definitely going to be a Senator then. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like playing on the Owen Sound attack, they haven't been fantastic this year. I mean, they're no Niagara uh, who, what do they have? A negative 114 goal differential. <laughs> it's rough. I can do a quick check on that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was just looking at it. Um, but Petrovsky has been, you know, pretty consistent for, for putting up points. He's close to Colby Barlow in points. The goals are much different, of course, but, He's providing that that middle six support to help this team score goals. They just aren't winning games, uh, giving them a much closer goal differential, even though they're last in their um, uh, their division. So, no, he's a, a really interesting prospect that shouldn't last very long in the draft at all. I'm thinking second, third round tops. Yeah, it is 114 goal differential for Niagara. Owen Sound, again, negative goal differential, but uh, not that bad as they are or as they have clinched the playoff spot. So oh, be interesting to see how far they will go. Can't maybe bank on a deep run, but hopefully it's going to be another opportunity for him to showcase what he has in, you know, meaningful games, especially in postseason. Mm hmm. Yeah, I you know five goals at the World Juniors. Uh, like you said, an impact player there. He, he's he's been really good for the own sound attack. He, minus fourteen, plus minus whatever. I uh, just I mean that's <laughs> the team he's on. I uh, yeah, we'll see what he does in the playoffs and and where he goes in the draft if uh, that does in fact become the case. All right. Let's uh, move to our prospects of the week. And we all have two of them. We've got a mention and then an expansion of what. <laughs> so uh, we've all done this. I, Peter, I'll go to you first. Uh, who do you got as your prospects of the week? I feel like I should like, because I missed two, I should have three, but I'm just going to keep it as two. <laughs> um, uh, one quick note. I'm not really a homer or usually a homer when it comes to Maple Leaf prospects, but with the, the way that Easton Cowan is playing, you know, he's extended his point streak to 34 games and is the leader for the London Knights in regards to point streaks or in regards to that point streak as a result. Um, the record that was previously held was Dave Gilmore back in 93-94. So Easton Cowan is on top of the London Knights history book. So congrats to him on that this massive point streak that started basically even before the World Juniors when mm-hmm. he when that was the last time when he didn't register a point. So good on him. Um, uh, but my main prospect of the week is going to be Tarek Parasic from the Prince George Cougars. Um, you know, we, we talk about how you know, we really didn't touch up on him during the rankings because I really wanted to save him for this because he is, I uh, believe, the eighth member of the 100-point club in the WHL right now. So it speaks volumes as to how dominant the WHL is when you have a player's hit the century mark. Mm-hmm. And, you know, did that recently. He's got 103 right now, but it's what he's done in the past six games. It's 16 points in his last six Um including a five point game against Vancouver before, you know, he went pointless, but then after that tallied another uh, 11 points right after that in four consecutive games. So what he's able to do is just absolutely phenomenal. He finds himself in the right areas. Again, doesn't have the best skating stride or posture, but he makes up for that with his awareness. He's always putting himself in the right spot and with how deep of a team that, you know, Prince George is as a rookie. Um, he's just like absolutely dominating the rookie class right now in the WHL. Uh, you know, Gavin McKenna, not too far behind. Obviously, we expect him to be, you know, a high level talent as well. 
But, you know, Prasic leading all rookies into WHO is absolutely phenomenal. Um, I, definitely a name to keep an eye on. Again, could you argue that maybe he's benefiting from playing with top tier players on a junior team? Maybe, but he does put himself in the right spots and he looked absolutely dynamic on that top line with Catton and Aginla in the uh, top prospects game. So he knows how to elevate his play when he's playing with better players. Um, so this is a guy that can do it all playmaking goal scoring. Um, even when he goes cold, he bounces right back. So he's going to be my prospect of the week mm. this week. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. I mean, 16 points in six games probably deserves a mention. That's for sure. <laughs> so yeah. that's a good one. All right, Dayton, uh, I know one of your prospect of the week. I kind of gave it away a little bit. Before, a little bit. That's but, okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, so I'm going to start with the other one. The other one's a mystery. Uh, also, <laughs> in case any of the viewers noticed a, a black tail showing up, uh, Pat has come <laughs> to visit. Apparently, he <laughs> must have joined. Yeah. <laughs> That'll love cats, eh? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, he's here. Anyways, um, top prospect. First, I'm going to mention Connor Unger, who just signed a professional contract with the Edmonton Oilers. He's a goalie. Most recently played with Brock University of U Sports, which is the Canadian college um, circuit, I guess. So it looks like their season ended February 9th, or at least he hasn't played since then. Um, I'm not as familiar at how that works, but he didn't post a save percentage under 907 in the last six starts. That's pretty good. Um, yeah, so he, he's got a lot of potential. He was with the Moose Jaw Warriors last year, had a 925 save percentage uh, over 38 games. This year, with the playoffs in uh, with Brock, he had a 928. Uh, looks like they didn't do too well, but that's okay. Goaltenders often are at the mercy of their own team. <laughs> and looking at some of the, the more personal stats will help get a better sense of kind of where they can be in the future. And Unger definitely has the potential to be a solid goaltender. If he's a starter, I don't know. But the Oilers are giving him a shot, and I think that's great. Uh, the second guy, of course, Gavin McKenna. So he's 16, in case anyone forgot. Uh, and he has 92 points. That is eight points away from hitting Connor Bedard's 16-year-old season. Now, there's only... Two games left in the WHL season, at least for the Tigers. That's eight points in two games. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. It's Gavin McKenna. <laughs> had... <laughs> He's had multiple games where he gets at at least four points. Uh, the last coming in um, February 19th, he had three goals and an assist. Before Three games before that, he had a four-point night. Two goals, two assists. Three games before that, he had a four-point night. One goal, three assists. This guy puts up points. Um, back in January, he had a six-point night. So he could even surpass <laughs> our guard season. Again, unlikely. Two games is not a lot of time. But the Tigers have been on a roll. They are entering the uh, WHL playoffs on... I think a win. I better check that before I just spout things here. Um, at least they looked good when I, I watched them last. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now it's going to be impossible to find quickly. Yeah, we'll go with that. Like they're entering the playoffs fourth seeded in, um, in the Eastern Conference. They're behind three really strong teams, so it's unlikely that they surpass them in these last few games here. Um, yeah, there's a 10-point gap between them and Moose Jaw. But still, they have a really, really strong core. It's led by uh, McKenna. So if they have a nice couple of matchups, he is in a really good position to surpass or at least hit that total. 
yeah, that, he's been just <laughs> he's not he's not eligible for the till the 2026 draft, just to let everyone know. I mean, <laughs> it's just the guy's not coming up soon. Uh yeah, the Tigers last they won their last game. They're on a two game winning streak right now. There we go. They yeah, they, so I mean, and they're playing the Lethbridge Hurricanes twice to end the season. So but that's a good matchup. Yeah. A good matchup. So he could. He could. We'll see. Yeah. Bet we'll, the over. We'll have an update soon. <laughs> no, I did just watch the uh, the Hurricanes play the uh the Hitmen. Their goalie that they had in looked didn't look very confident. So if they can get some quick goals, he's he can kind of fall apart. So I think the Tigers have a great opportunity to to boost up McKenna's numbers. <laughs> well, I'm sure they know this and they'll be trying to feed him the puck, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, for sure. You gotta. <laughs> All right, mine, I'll go with uh, my two here. And one, just a brief uh, mention, Elias Pettersson, not that one. Uh, the defenseman, He was. he's now in North America and he's with the Abbotsford Canucks. He has not played a game yet. Uh, probably won't get in for a bit, but he's practicing with them. He's there. I getting ready to go. He's a number he's wearing number 26, not number 43 or not number 40 like uh, Elias Pettersson in the NHL. He does also like number 40, but obviously he's already changed it. He's like I'm not getting 40 in Vancouver. So I he is number 26 in the AHL. I you know had a really solid World Juniors. I played most of his time in the in Al Svenskan, uh, which is a a league below the SHL uh, played pretty, really well. Had uh, quite a few points, but his, his game is, is too, he's, he's not an offensive defenseman or a two-way guy, um, physical, really good mobility. I, I I'm really excited to see what he can do in the NHL. That'll be probably a few years down the road. We'll see how he kind of adjusts to the AHL and the smaller ice, but uh, I'm excited to see what he can accomplish. He'll probably play, um, maybe some an AHL playoff games. Uh, we'll see how they deploy him because the Abbotsford Canucks have a really loaded left side. So we'll see where he kind of fits in. Um, he could take Akito Hirose's spot on the blue line and see how he does. So I'm excited to see what he can do in the AHL. My main guy is Aiden McDonough because uh, I'm sure if you've watched the show in the past, I've mentioned this guy quite a few times in our prospect of the week and, uh, updates for the Canucks and he's had a bit of a quiet first AHL season he's got nine goals and 16 points in 46 games but most of those goals have come in the last 10 games and uh, he's got five of them actually <laughs> I four no four four of them four of the nine have been scored in the month of, month of March so he's been most of the season been a bit cold uh, having a bit of trouble adjusting to the AHL game and the pace of it but, you know, as expected, he did make his NHL debut last season. He played six games, had a, his first NHL goal. Looked decent. I, but, I mean, the AHL is different. Uh, he's not playing in the top six. He's playing uh, lesser minutes. He's not really on the power play a lot. So it's the adjustments. Uh, going from, from university where you're in college where he's the top guy and he's, he's playing all situations – and now uh, he's down and playing in a bit lesser role. So it's expected. I'm glad he's starting to score goals, maybe get some confidence, because uh, I still have high hopes that he can be a good bottom six uh, forward in the NHL. So uh, Aiden McDonough is my prospect of the week, along with Pedersen. All right, there's uh, that's another week of the of Prospect Corner. We uh, So that was some good good discussion about the draft after taking a break from it a bit and talking different prospect pools. Uh, well, we didn't take a break. We still talked about the 2024 draft and targets within those pools. So uh, we'll continue that next week and uh, still talk about different. I, what I want to do as we go through is highlight different profiles we get released on the hockey writers. So keep an eye out as we get going here, we'll be we'll be touching on maybe a prospect profile of the week. I don't know. We'll see how how the segment goes, but uh, there's going to be multi, quite a few profiles released every day as we get going here. Uh, once that Macklin Celebrini one is released, you're going to see a ton and the draft guide and all that. 
So uh, keep an eye out at the hockeywriters.com for that uh, when Peter gets that out um, because then we're full and we've hit the ground running and we're going to have a ton mm-hmm. of profiles coming out. So draft, the NHL draft coverage, we've we've started coverage of this, on the show here, but at the site, there's going to be a ton of content uh, coming up. So keep an eye out there, the sub stack, and we got Dayton's rankings coming out there, uh, probably some more exclusive articles. So uh, Dayton, you have a, a sneak preview for the next uh, deep dive or have you chosen one yet? Ooh, uh, I'm debating between a couple, um, which I can reveal here for anyone who watches or listens. <laughs> I, I'm thinking either Berkeley Catton, because he is such an interesting uh, mm-hmm. prospect. His his skill is so high, but he's not consistently a top five player in the draft, which I'm like, why is that? Why is he not <laughs> higher? Yeah. Um, and then Artem Levshunov, who you don't have as high. A lot of other people have quite high. So is he the best defenseman? And I'd like to take a look at that. Before that, or even after that, depending on how things go, there might be a look at something that I've been doing, the reason I went to Calgary on the weekend, which is trying to see every WHL arena in, uh, well, see the team play at home. So I've got I've got a few under under my belt so far, and I'm getting ready to publish the first episode, just kind of setting the scene. Nice. And I'll, uh, you can probably guess where it is, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been really, really fun so far. It's going to take a long time, especially for some of those. Uh, well, there's a couple of BC teams that are not going to be easy to get to <laughs> and uh, a couple in Washington, but no, uh, those will start to come out semi-frequently in the next a uh, couple of months, especially getting into the summer, the off season, we'll, we'll get a few out there. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. So look, look forward to that. Uh, you won't be getting that unless you subscribe to the premium tier of the hockey writers, uh, draft prospects, sub stack. So check out the link below and get some, some previews there. There's a bit out there that you can read on free trials. So uh, take a look. Um, you won't regret it. All right. Uh, Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Dayton, for for talking prospects here on the Prospect Corner again. Um, we'll see you next week with all a bunch of well, well profiles released uh, by then. So uh, we'll we'll talk about that. So, but until until then, we'll see you on another episode of Prospect Corner.